Good morning, everybody. It's good fun. Thank you all for joining us at this uh, very early hour. I'm um, glad to see some faces. Honestly, I was a little bit worried because, you know, Saturday morning, uh, everyone's at the parade and then getting back from the parade and that whole thing. So thank you for joining us. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great, great, great. So, um, uh, first order of business is... Uh, Things are a little bit different this year, so I request, you know, keep your mask over your nose and mouth for the entirety of the panel. Pull it down if you got to take a quick sip of something, but otherwise, try to keep things buttoned up. Um, otherwise, welcome to the science track. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see you all are here. Uh, when you are done here, we will be closing up the room, but you can come join us in um, Hilton Grand West for parasitism for fun and profit after this, if you want to <laughs> meander on over there. Um, otherwise, we do have a lot of our events in this room. Um, cell phones, if you have them, please put them on silent. Um, otherwise, uh, we're going to clear this room after, as I already said, because we're closing it up. And if you haven't already, please donate to Dragon Con's charity this year. We are doing Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Atlanta. So if you haven't yet, consider donating. If you have, thank you very much. Um... Otherwise, uh, welcome to single point of departure, Ooh. and uh, <laughs> let's get started. I will let our wonderful slate of panelists introduce themselves, starting from Jen on my right. I, do I have to introduce my... No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Jen, or Jennifer. Um, I'm a postdoc in astronomy from Uppsala University in Sweden, uh, though I'm originally from the U.S., uh, and I study extrasolar planets, so basically I study the atmospheres of planets in other solar systems to try and learn if maybe they could have life on them. Okay, good morning. I guess we'll all go like the old Chevy Chase movie, Dr. Doctor, Dr. Doctor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I am the Dr. Doctor. Theta Daniels Race. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Louisiana State University. Um, uh, with, I guess, more gray hair than anybody else on the panel. I, I uh, spent uh, pretty much the 90s. I was a professor at Duke University and then, frankly, got an offer I couldn't refuse to come down to LSU where they were doing more experimental work than at Duke, which was going in a theoretical direction. My work is in um, nanomaterials, nanoelectronics. Basically, I've been nano long before it was cool. Um, <laughs> but essentially, I study the electro-optical phenomena as exhibited by electronic materials in the nanoscale. Uh, I'm Doug Burby. I'm actually not a doctor. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> he's super smart. Mike, Mike oh. you have to eat the mic. Uh, I, I'm not actually a doctor. I was a, I was a young lad in the 80s attending college for what back then was only a computer sciences degree. They didn't have like 55. So it was me and my Commodore 64 toiling oh, yeah. along, uh, <laughs> learning COBOL, Fortran, and BASIC. Somehow or another, I ended up joining the Army. I spent 20 years in the Army uh, before I retired. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Army, I fell into, I became a uh, defense acquisition, information technologies, uh, advanced concept developer. Uh, so I spent the last 17 years after I retired, I became a Department of the Army civilian, and now I'm a program manager for offensive electronic warfare, uh, cyber defenses, and tactical networks for the Army. So tactical are, you know, not ships and planes. I'm on battlefields and, and tanks. Um, wondering uh, how we conduct cyber warfare, electronic warfare, and I build, I, we call them toys, I, I build the R&D prototypes and all that stuff that eventually get turned in as you the rest. So I work with defense industry on advanced concept technologies. All right, so uh, I'm Scott Harris. I am the uh, the local person. Uh, as I was tell telling him, my uh, office is three miles down the street at a little uh, big round 71-foot room called the Fernbank Planetarium. And uh, so I'm in charge of public programming there, but uh, also a researcher and instructor. My background um, is, as everyone can always tell by my accent, uh, I'm a native. Um, and uh, but uh, educated by way of Arizona State, uh, UGA, and Brown up in Providence in that order. And uh, while I started looking at rocks when I was about uh, you know half the the you know not quite up even to the bottom of the table here, uh, somehow decided to apply my interest in rocks to rocks on other planets, and spent the first part of my career dealing with volcanoes, but then have spent the last uh, twenty. 
one years of my career dealing with rocks hitting things, and so studying uh, asteroid and comet impacts, and so a little bit, I guess, if you you want to. Um, down there talking about looking at, uh, you know, habitats to create life. I'm in the business of figuring out how to kill them. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so, um, basically done things all over the world, but, you know, like a bad penny came back home and was happy to, uh, to be at Fernbank for the last seven years. And, uh, we wish we could, you know, invite you down when you're not here to come down and see a great planetarium show and all, but, Despite being one of the large planetariums, we are owned by a public school system and have a resident student population. So until all this craziness gets sorted out, our, uh, those students will come first, and we have to do everything online, which I invite you to go to our Facebook site and, and see us because we do things. So. And uh, I just want to briefly remind all of our panelists, as Scott perfectly demonstrated, eat the mic. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, yum, yum. Uh, hi, my name is Liz. I will be moderating today. So um, the way that this is pretty much going to work is we are going to discuss either some fundamental changes to the basic rules of the universe or some differences in when man, you know, humanity discovered uh, various properties of things or where we went in various technological directions. And our panelists will discuss what impacts those changes might have, both some obvious ones and maybe some not so obvious ones. And I'm going to leave a little bit of time at the end for all y'all to ask some questions, if you have any. So uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. So let's start with sort of fundamental constants and other very fundamental properties of our universe. I think the one that always people are wondering about is, you know, what would happen if the speed of light was different or didn't even exist? You know, what if you could go as fast as you want? So um, I think several of our panelists might have some opinions here. I'll start with Jen. Sure. Um, I have several opinions on this, I suppose. So um, I was thinking about this first because I live now on a different continent from basically my entire family um, on the speed of electronic communication that right now I can just pick up my laptop and do a quick Zoom call home. Um, and if the speed of light, for example, was much, much slower, that would be maybe not so easy. There would be a huge delay in sending signals back and forth, even across distances like that. If it were, for example, much, much faster, you could have people, they have these problems with, for example, driving the rover on Mars, that there's a delay in how long it takes to transmit signals back and forth to Mars. So if the robot's about to crash and you send a panic signal from Earth, by the time it gets there, the robot has already run into that boulder. Um, but if the speed of light was much, much faster, maybe we could drive the rover in real time, which would be really cool. Um, and I also thought about this in terms of maybe space travel, um, because, of course, the speed of light sets the maximum speed for space travel. And so if you want to go to a um, planet that's four or five light years away uh, and you can go at the speed of light, which right now we can't, but, you know, just imagine that you can, it would take you four years to get there. But if the speed of light was much faster, then um, we could travel great distances in space, maybe a little bit easier if we could get that fast. Do uh, the rest of you all have some uh, thoughts on what would happen? Really, for me, with, with the speed of light changes, because I forgot to mention I'm also an author. I, I, I write uh, militarized yeah. urban fantasy novels as well. So I, I go into a lot of third and fourth and, and what-if drills in, in the concept. Yeah. So if you looked at the speed of light being changed, I, I would have to think of how it would affect the entirety of the various different spectrum spectrums and even like how you see and how you perceive motion mm -hmm. and movement. So if you took about away a constant of the speed of light or made it easily malleable, how would people's perceptions mm -hmm. of their environment change? Um, would you perceive things faster? Would you perceive things slower? Would you perceive things at a different rate um, than other organic creatures on the planet, which would change evolution and, and development? as well so if you went from it was a constant but faster or slower how would that change the development of the humans if our bodies were designed to operate at a quicker response because mm -hmm. we perceive things faster would we be leaner thinner faster type <laughs> sentient creatures <laughs> or if we light move slower and we perceive things slower we would be more slothish mm -hmm. um, how would that affect cultures and developments and societies inside of, of there so 
for me, it really goes into everything downstream on how you would perceive your environment because mm-hmm. light affects so much stuff around us. Uh, communications was the first thing I came to because you know, <laughs> that's my field. Yeah. You know, if I can make life faster, you know, that getting that rover control to Mars mm-hmm. for me that just goes into space and you yeah. know, galactic relay center set up because we can push Absolutely. data across the universe. You know, essentially retransmitting satellites that aren't in our orbit but orbits of other planets. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's where I kind of go inside of that. I guess so. Take a stab at it. Um, as I was thinking, one thing that's that every time I watch, and I'm going to go a little bit into the fiction end of it, right? So, of yes. course, we are talking fiction anyway in terms of changing the speed <laughs> of light. But when you look at different um, movies and, and uh, television and books and so forth, um, one that comes to mind for me is um, it began with an I. It was... The, the, the earth, this is my husband, <laughs> the earth was losing its oxygen. Interstellar. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was kept thinking of Inception, but that's the other one. Okay. <laughs> um, Interstellar. And in that one, um, if you recall, if I recall correctly, correctly, if not, uh, do so let me know. It was the idea of there were, were these beings, or maybe it was the, that much more evolved humans, what have you. But there was the dimension that was also time, right? Mm-hmm. That fourth dimension. So, so in other words, if you walked from here to here, it wasn't just you were going up a physical hill, but you were maybe going across, you know, so many years and years. Mm-hmm. And you remember the sad part of the movie. I it didn't. I won't spoil it for you. But suffice it to say, don't go back for the data when the ship is about to be flooded and you're going to die if you don't make it on there. Just, just, so, just so you know. I mean, the data is important. I get it. I get it. Right. I love my science, engineering, but don't go back for the data. I have seen students do crazy stuff, like when the chem lab <laughs> is filling with smoke. And no offense, because my husband was once one of these, but he didn't do this. And the and the pre meds are still titrating, and we're going get out of the lab. It's filling with smoke. But I gotta get that, you know. So anyway, the point back to to the point is, is for your grade. You got great grades. Get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. Hope you get <laughs> Shush. I, I was. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. No, he wasn't in that lab. Those those were silly people. <laughs> so the point is to think about if I don't think speed of light was necessarily um, or very directly discussed in that movie, mm-hmm. right? And so, what if? we could consider light, and forgive me physicists if this is already the case, this is not, I'm just kind of surmising, it's not my my specialty, but if we could consider light essentially as part of those dimensions, you know, every movie goes space-time continuum. So what if in terms of, as my colleague mentioned, perception, and you also had that fourth dimension of time, now how do you work it out? Because you are moving length with height, you are changing time frames, but your perception of when that changes now, if you're a being born into that different light speed, it's fine, but suppose you're the astronaut trying to get home. So that's just a flight of fancy that came to mind for me. I'm not sure I exist now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're certainly, if we didn't have a speed of light that was a constant, then your perception of you existing certainly would be screwed up. Yeah. Um... I'm just thinking in terms of, I, I, I mean, everything we perceive is actually, with our eyes, is very dependent on the fact that the speed of light is not the same everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's depend, it slows up, speeds, speeds up, depending on what medium it's going through. I get to depend on that looking through a microscope, identifying different, different minerals. Mm-hmm. And if we simply, as, as, as um, Jim was talking about, if you have, you know, the, sort of a, if you talk about, that sort of starting point being higher or lower than just simply, you know, things like my shirt becomes wilder or, or, <laughs> or, 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 you know, minerals, uh, certain minerals become possibly more pretty under, you know, under doubly polarized uh, conditions. But if you didn't have a constant, if it could just d- randomly change, then the way we perceive everything would just, you can't even speculate about what that would be like. Well, and I'm not a biologist, so uh, forgive me if I go off base here, but um, you were talking about, say, you're an astronaut and you're visiting a planet where the speed of light is different than what you're used to, then maybe, I mean, we were talking about if the speed of light was much, much faster, we'd have to have much faster reaction times. Well, if you're um, an astronaut visiting a planet where the speed of light is a lot quicker than it is on Earth, then 
you're going to have trouble keeping up with everything that's happening around you. Uh, on the other hand, I suppose if it's much, much slower than you used to, then maybe you look like the flash because you can just like do everything super quickly. But I wonder if that might be an issue as well. If say it's different on different, if it was, for example, different on different planets in some alternate universe as well. Was that not, and I have to look at my friend here, my fellow, I say Trekkie because I'm from the old school of, instead of Trekker. So if you're a Trekker, I still love you, no offense. But was there not an episode of Star Trek where there were beings who, when they, people perceived them as like something buzzing, remember? And then, in, but in fact, they were moving, what was it, much, much faster than everyone else. They were hyper speed, they were out of phase uh -huh. with everything else. Yeah, so there's a phase issue there, right? And when I think uh -huh. of signal processing mm -hmm. and communications, which I haven't done since an undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I did that, I remember telling the professor, do you know this homework took us 30 hours this week? Oh this was, and it was no joke. And, and I said, it was just a bunch of equations. I mean, it feels like Algebra Olympics or Calculus Olympics. And he goes, is that all? And we all went, oh, 30 hours, is that all? OK, yeah. So my students better not complain. Now but they have it all on the apps, though. <laughs> all my engineers just pull up an app and tell me what the formula is. Oh, not in my class, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but that was, a, it wasn't, I don't remember. Was it so much a thing of light? Or, or could could have been the perception. It was just simply a matter of speed. But um, if indeed it was a difference in the perception of light, then maybe that's some of what mm -hmm. you guys are touching on. Talking about the, the Star Trek, though, I mean, I'll, I'll refer to my uh, you know physics uh, friends up here. With I mean, the whole concept of traveling with warp space. Mm -hmm. But if suddenly you had uh, a variable speed of light, then mm. wouldn't traveling at warp speed be a little more dangerous? <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> I mean, one of the things, and I, I wanted to pose this as a question to our, our panelists, one of the things I would be worried about is would all my electronic devices built on Earth, dependent on our speed of light, would they continue to work correctly if the speed of light was different? I mean, right off the head, I would say no. I mean, yeah. just thinking about the difference of current and electronic devices. I mean, you, yeah. you take a digital clock that's a 110 clock here uh, stateside. You take it overseas, even if you have a power yeah. converter inside of there, the cycle rate inside of there affects the electronics. And, that, and that's just mm -hmm. merely a change of current cycle. Yeah. You know, not something as severe as a base scientific function. So I, I would say it would absolutely have to affect uh, electronics. And what about in the optoelectronics realm? So I'll get back to my home of mm -hmm. electronic materials. So if y'all are familiar with, and again, I, I always say I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but you know, um, I, I'd rather start with where everybody knows what, what I'm talking about instead of like, oh, this is so fancy, and I put you to sleep, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, what's the point? So if you think about materials, have what's known as a band gap, and you can just think about effectively, um, you know, uh, theoretically, we describe what it takes, say, for an electron to get from, let's think of it as an area where there are lots of electrons in their, in their field to an area where there's few. And I use the example lots of times of, in this room, if, if the first two rows were totally filled, right, no one could sit in them. But if I started maybe putting, you know, uh, giving you a hot seat, I put some, a match under or a torch under one of your seats, then that person is probably going to jump up and hopefully go to one of the empty seats in the back. Somewhere between where they started and where they ended up in materials that we call semiconductors, there's a gap. There's a band gap. In metals, there's just basically like we're all in this together. And in insulators, the band gap is huge. Yeah. So it's like you got to jump from the one to the ten in hopscotch, right? That's anybody remember hopscotch? I mean mm -hmm. that too. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, I haven't thought about that in years myself either. But regardless, the point is that you are moving across a certain band gap, and one of the things that translates to is if the material emits light, at what wavelength does it do so, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now you've got an issue of, and we know in the electromagnetic spectrum, at what wavelength you're operating, or, or sorry, what wavelength you perceive uh, will be a certain color, right? So in the short wavelength range, you're getting into the blue and the you know, ultraviolet, and lower down, you're getting into the reds and the greens. So the point is if, if the light speed, which I honestly have never really thought of with the materials, changes, then in fact, how does one make a laser that's going to operate at a certain speed and a certain power? 
You know, you don't want the right. PowerPoint, the laser you're using in your presentation to burn a hole through it. <laughs> I, I, just thought about work, this, I just thought about the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah me work, too. You probably do. You know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, hell yeah. I can use it every day. But <laughs> it would have to be consistent, repeatable, you know. Yeah. 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 Don't mix this up in a presentation. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. my eyes. No, <laughs> Good ideas. I get the cash. We'll make a mess. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm, I'm a with government you. bureaucrat. I can do paperwork. I'll get you a grant. Oh, oh, God, you're singing my song. Grant, are you kidding me? Yes, yes. And this is how we started a business at Dragon <laughs> Con this morning. We will all form an FFRD for our academic organizations. Yeah. So I think we could basically do an entire panel on just if the speed of light changed. But I think uh, let's, let's move on to a few other fundamental ideas. So, um, so water, as uh, many of you know, when you oh, freeze no. it, it expands. So then you get an ice cube that floats in your water. Um, and the fact that upon freezing, water expands is actually kind of unusual across most materials that freeze. So what if water wasn't the odd one out? What if water got smaller when you froze it? Would that have any implications on, you know, everything? <laughs> we <Scott> die. <laughs> Do you know why we die, though? Yeah. The, the oceans freeze. Hmm. Because the as the ice forms um, and it becomes more dense, it sinks. And then once you have ice down at the bottom of a pool of liquid, then it takes more heat away from the water next to it, and that freezes. While you've also got ice coming in from the top. So everything freezes from the bottom up. Clearly fish are in trouble, uh, but everything's in trouble. And uh, basically you could in principle, freeze the entire planet over and not be able to recover if it weren't for those little volcanoes I mentioned before. But that has some that has a, some interesting effects I might mention in a minute, but maybe see if anyone else has any ideas about how bad it would be. Now, immediately, I thought, so if it's freezing and becoming more dense and then therefore shrinking down and, and just the ge geological effects of you're starting to fill every crack deeper and deeper and harder and harder and then you have volcanoes and you have a warming cycle the expansion of that will slowly start ripping Ooh. apart the crust of everything inside of there so so you would have a constant freeze warming cycle of the earth of the earth is literally just burrowing farther down wedging itself farther apart volcanic actions repeating the cycle until essentially you split it split the planet in half. Yeah. Or into a whole bunch of little yeah, things. Let's call it a spectacular I don't explosion bad, taking a place over a billion years. But it will be spectacular. The only thing I can say is I'm going to get an I told you so when I get home. Um, because this gentleman here, who I give proper credit and homage to, to his many accomplishments, is an MD who delivered babies for many years and uh, also later on got a law degree, not because he got sued, <laughs> nothing like that. He just enjoyed both uh, law and medicine, health policy. And when we were talking about this panel and I mentioned, he says, what, why don't you talk about water? And what happens with water? I was like, ah. <laughs> it's like, that's, I don't really so do a lot of work with that. So is he a hobbyist hydrologist? I, he's a lot of stuff. <laughs> he's a lot of good, good. He's actually now a law school professor, a professor of law and medicine. So he delivered the last baby some years back. Don't say how long, right? <laughs> Sorry? Don't say how long. Okay, okay. <laughs> and now he teaches people why, you know, um, well, uh, constitutional law, health law, if you want to know anything about that. <laughs> but go on. Water. Yes, he told me I should talk about that. And I went, eh. <laughs> so there you go. They're more expert than I am on that. So <laughs> this is true. Although I was, I'm not a geologist, but I was just thinking about the, the planet and how many sort of large. I'm going to use the term land masses, but it's not entirely correct. But like all the big masses of ice floating on the ocean, right? Like Antarctica, for example. If ice sinks, like, bye bye Antarctica, like that. And then like, what does that do to the geological structure of the planet? If all of a sudden whole large masses of things that are on the surface of the earth disappear. I, I don't know what that does to the rest of the continents, but... Take the mic. 
it doesn't form a whoa hi. Uh, it doesn't form a, like a very regular crystalline structure, but on planets very far away, large like a lot of pressure, um, it does form something that sinks. It forms I seven, which Ooh. is a very very regular crystal structure. So it's just because water is just weird being yeah. you know H two O. So if water at our our our, temp our our pressure would sink, that would also imply a very fundamental difference in its own structure and its own, it wouldn't be its very, very polar H2O. Right. So how would, so another th thing to think and about is just, die. yeah, it's yeah. like how, how would, how, how would water behave in us considering we are 70% water? It would be very water. difficult to get clean. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> because I always tell my students, that's why, you know, why do you, we, we go into talking about water and activity and melting. I mean, we to create melts on this planet, a lot of them are created by putting fluxes in them, including CO2 and water. Mm -hmm. And so if, if water was, was – um, water is a great flux because it's a, po it's a polar molecule. And we use – the same reason we use to clean. It separates things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's that's a problem. We, we would all – one of the other compounds that, that does this, of course, is um, – if I remember, ammonium. So we'd all, all become ammonium-based, uh, which is uh, just seems bad. Yeah, but, it seems bad. But <laughs> but ta talking about the the large scale processes, one of the, the you know, in principle, the outer part of the 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 planet getting warmth from the sun would, if you're close enough to the sun, if you're not close enough to the sun, you're going to just freeze. But if you're war where we are and and uh, and that water is uh, more is somehow still behaving like water. Um, then there's enough solar radiation to keep the uh, some kind of liquid or slush at the surface. But then you start running into all kinds of other problems. And we start talking about volcanoes. You kind of depend on that to then heat things back up so you don't totally freeze. But at that point, water, it, let's just assume that plate tectonics got started, which probably wouldn't if this were the case. But if it did, was here and suddenly this happened, you would actually have big slabs of ice. And I mean like kilometers and kilometers and kilometers, tens of kilometers of ice going down subduction zones, which means you would actually inject enormous amounts of water into the mantle, which probably would melt the whole thing. Mm. And that goes to what you're saying about yep. that, that. That's probably how you'd, the, you'd end the planet. I'd die of a heart attack because I walked through the woods in the, in the winter and my blood got more solid and killed me. <laughs> But the spectacular explosion of the planet could not be discounted for its awesomeness. No, that's what we strive for. Yeah. Can you tell I write apocalyptic fiction? <laughs> I just love how quickly we've blown up planets. Uh, this brings me great joy. Uh, no, I was thinking about like the structure of an ocean, ocean world or ocean moon. Because, for example, um, we have the moon Europa, which we think has ice on the surface and water underneath. But if the ice is sinking, then like what is an what does an ocean world look like? Is it ice on the bottom and water on the top? And I assume that then changes how sea life would evolve on a planet like that, because maybe the water, you could only have water as deep as it's warm enough for it to stay liquid. Am I on the right track here? Yeah, and it just made me think of something I was men mentioning uh, before we got started. The, uh, when you talk, start talking about, okay, let's imagine everything freezes over, but we're okay here even if the sun turns itself off because we've got technology and we can, you know, warm things up and keep ourselves comfortable. Um, well, you better be planning on doing doing that with something other than petroleum because that sea life you're talking about, is little micro sea life is what produces that petroleum, and it's really dead um, because there's no it has no chance because even if there were like little plankton that were living just in that little scummy slush that you imagine at the top from the warmth of the sun, that's where it would stay. It has no chance of getting buried, which is really important because it has to get warm and toasty and well after it dies and mature and turn into that petroleum and it's not going anywhere. So no no fuel, but it doesn't matter, we're dead anyway. <laughs> One um, point of order, I think primarily for the audience, we will have Q and A at the end, so if you can just save your questions until then. Um, but anyway, so uh, water, speed of light. Let's uh, talk about some human discoveries or choices uh, throughout our own technological development. Oh, no. um, so, <laughs> just mine. <laughs> got, got two of them. Got two of them. <laughs> 
Um, so the one that I'm, I'm personally interested in hearing about is um, early on in semiconductor development, we, we did not initially start with silicon as our uh, sort of element of choice. I believe we started with another. Um, Bita, can you, can you uh, discuss sort of the choice we made and what would happen if we didn't make that choice? Sure thing. Um, so we, as was mentioned, we begin with, if you want to think of the first transistor, you can go back further, but the first transistor was done with germanium, right? Um, and I believe that was 1947, Bell Laboratories, which um, actually did an internship at one time, by the way, no longer, sadly, is there. It's a cool place. You can be a student, be down the hall from a Nobel laureate, and they're just like regular people. Anyway, um, we begin with germanium, and I believe it was actually a bipolar junction transistor, which means, remember a minute ago when I was telling you guys about it, the first two rows were filled, and I maybe neglected to mention filled with electrons, right? Mm -hmm. And the back rows maybe had some electrons like y'all sitting in your spots, right? But there's some number of empty spots. So that area where there are empty spots, we're going to call that the conduction band because we can conduct, you can move from seat to seat. Mm -hmm. And down here where you're filled, we're going to call that the valence band because you, you can't move, right? Every seat's filled if you can imagine that. Okay, so semiconductors have that characteristic of having a band gap. And the varying band gaps, as I mentioned before, have to do with the, um, uh, you know, the electron U for whatever reason of stimulus, just maybe natural temperature, you're not comfortable, and so you want to move to another spot, or it could be like some stimulus, like I heat your seat up. But regardless, when these electrons can move, there is a region that we call, or we theoretically describe as the conduction band. So they have a certain level of conductivity between that of a metal, most conductive, and an insulator, least conductive. Now, why did we pick silicon? Well, as it turned out, germanium, First transistor sounds great, but um, likewise along the way, and I'm not sure if I can give you an actual date for it, but as electronics and other materials were, dis were studied, both germanium and silicon are in column four of the periodic chart. So it's like, okay, they kind of got a thing going, they're close enough. But silicon, as it turns out, the bonds between, say, the if you want to think about you know, the, the nucleus and you have the electrons that are they're closest to the nucleus, they're more tightly bonded, they're further away, they're, they're least tightly bonded. Those are the ones that can do that moving between the seats, conduction. Silicon has a, a better bond structure, if you will. So if you were to heat up silicon beyond, uh, or germanium beyond certain temperatures, those bonds want to break more easily. So it's like you have less tolerance for sitting in your seat when that heat. You know, you want to get out of that seat in the valence band where everybody's filled and you want to get back there to the conduction band. Well, that would be okay, except, well, I, I, as I mentioned, live in Louisiana. And all I can say is, I don't know, if we had semiconductors that didn't have as much tolerance for heat, we couldn't really operate our computers like we like. Now, some people think we can't anyway. Don't pick on us, Georgia. But we, <laughs> we can. So that being said, um, silicon has a, has a bond structure that's more amenable to the higher temperatures. But a few big things on silicon. One of the biggies is it's easy to produce an oxide, silicon dioxide. Now, technically, we already have that when you look at sand, right? And when you look at sand, you're looking at silicon, but it's silicon that sand gets processed, and that's a whole other story, but it gets pro processed and refined and so forth into silicon. But the reason you want an oxide, which means a layer that has both the semiconductor, you know, has, it, well, it's more of an insulator, but it's the material that has the silicon that is a semiconductor, and we're adding oxygen to it, and we're making it more of an insulator, and producing SiO2, silicon dioxide, is that in electronic devices, if you think about it, if everything were entirely conductive, right, and you've just got one big metal, well, how do you turn it off? Where's the mm -hmm. switch? There's nothing you can do. Yeah. But there are transistors, for example, known as the MOS, um, MOSFET, Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. And the deal there, I see my, my computer scientist, uh, uh, son shaking his head, <laughs> the deal there is that you need to have devices where you can, number one, have a switch, right? Transistors are looked at as amplifiers or switches. And number two, you want something, I'm going to go to the engineering perspective here, that's uh, cheap, mm -hmm. relatively easy to produce, not easy, but easier than other materials, and gives you more bang for the buck. So with mm -hmm. silicon, it's easy to produce a good pure oxide. Mm -hmm. The work done on that has been certainly way more expensive, uh, extensive rather than other materials. So if you have that layer of silicon, and you have your nice oxide, let's say right here, then if you have your carrier flow, maybe your contacts of your metal, then you can kind of monitor what's going you know, this way, this way. You can do what we call passivate the layer, which is cover it with an oxide layer. So silicon, so to speak, gives you more bang for the buck in terms of its um, 
cost effectiveness in terms of its ability not just to be a semiconductor, but to give you that little insulator layer that you can. You can get oxides in other materials. I mean, there's oxygen, there's oxides everywhere, but you need a certain purity of oxide and a certain controllability of the oxide. Germanium just didn't quite give us all of that, right? It can be done, but ultimately it's, it's, it's frankly, it would be more expensive. Um, it would, uh, I was looking up, where do we get germanium? Well, it's mined in different types of, it's a, an ore. What is it? Uh, I have it written down. I was trying to my cheat sheet. I'm glad somebody else had notes. I got them too, but they're in my purse. But let's just put it this way. You can get germanium, but you can get out of Alaska hmm. and Tennessee, <laughs> okay, um, in terms of, and in, in China and Russia, and I think maybe it was Belgium. You see the cost factor going on there? Hmm. You know, Tennessee is going to jack us up with a price. Like, you want your germanium? <laughs> okay. But, um, but silicon, sand everywhere. So if we had, I'll finish with this, sorry, a bit long. If we had uh, gone the route of germanium, we, I believe, would have seen slower progress in terms of electronic development because we would have been fighting a bit more with the material. Not that silicon's easy, but it is more amenable to what was accomplished in what was then micro and then later nanoelectronics with silicon as opposed to other materials. But there are plenty. I worked for years in gallium arsenide, right? Because um, silicon doesn't emit light. That's this one foothold we got in other materials. You can get light emission in other compounds like gallium arsenide, which is gallium from column three of the periodic chart, and arsenic from column five of the periodic chart. Three fives, as we call them. Those emit light. But think about it. Now you've got two elements, and you've got more to deal with than one. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So you were talking about how silicon operates better at high temperatures. Um, as an astronomer, we routinely cool, for example instruments on telescopes down to very, very cold temperatures to eliminate noise from mm -hmm. caused by the heat that they're generating. Is there a difference between how the two of them operate at cold temperatures? I would tell you this. I, quite honestly, I would have to look up the temperature range, but silicon does have a wider range okay. because even in, in my work, which is down at you know the nanoscale, you're looking at the, the great universe, I'm looking teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. We actually, to see some of the, uh, the simple electronic process I just mentioned of going from the valence band to what we call the conduction band. Now, chemists, when y'all talk about valence, and valency is a little bit different. So uh, I wanna, I'm just trying to tell you, electrons moving from here to back there, right? Um, when we need to look at things in the nanoscale, we too have to eliminate noise and interference. Mm -hmm. And literally, it would be like um, trying to get a picture of a, of a kid that's wiggling or an adult in their seat, and you say, keep still, because you know, with older cameras, you don't want it to get blurry, right? So in order to keep you still, we cool you down. And at least in the work that I've uh, collaborated with or done. I do have the equipment in my lab, but we don't have anybody who knows how to make a good helium transfer. Um, <laughs> I was never trained in that either, and I'm not going to trust somebody to just try it. Um, we can get down to four degrees K. I don't know if you guys go lower. No? Not on the telescopes I'm using. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. And I know there's, I, I have, there's research down to absolute, you know, getting to absolute zero. I've not kept up with how close they've gotten to that, but I know at IBM, when they were looking at, um, you know, this the whole, everything's quantum, right? Every, everything, even the cartoons, they talk about quantum, quantum. But there was some work done at, at uh, one of the IBM research labs that I read about a while ago, and it might have been at, put at a university, but they had an instrument that was like down in the bowels of the basement or lower of the building. So, because actually some of the instrumentation I use, if you walk across the floor, that's too much vibration. Mm. So you got to sit yourself down and be quiet and do your work because you want to mess up the measurement. Um, but also to cool it down to almost absolute zero so they could look at certain effects at the, you know, the, the quantum world is so much different from the world we're sitting in. But to get these seven angstrom, I believe, is it, no, seven, ten, seven nanometer mm -hmm. um, channel regions of transistors, channel region meaning where the action is, you know, where something, something gets from A to B so that you get an electronic effect of the transistor. And they've gotten it down to like seven nanometers in size. And if you think about nanometer, I always say, take a piece of paper, uh, and say this is just a thin piece of paper or a page of this gentleman's book. Um, we're gonna promote the book here, because that's cool, yeah. And all the ones after it. There you go, there you go. And just slice that down to 100,000 times thinner. There you're looking at 
a nanometer. You know, it, a meter for you know, a meter is a, a little bit bigger than three feet. So a yard for anybody who sews, any cosplayers, right? So you buy some fabric by the yard. But if you um, want to take a meter. Think of, like me growing up in the English instead of the um, metric system as much, think of um, something a little bit more than three feet, cut that into a billion equal pieces, and one billionth of that of that meter is a nanometer, one times ten to the minus ninth. Or a nanometer is about, uh, what, a gold atom is about a third of a nanometer. So wherever you pick your poison, you know, fabric or, you know, atoms or a piece of paper, your hair, depending on how thick your hair is, if you slice it down 70, a strand of hair, I'm not going to pull it because it hurt, but slice it down 75,000 times or 100,000 times somewhere in there, you're going to get your nanometer. But to, to your point, to get back to um, temperatures, the electronics that's used to do that, mm -hmm. um, there are, I would say, certainly silicon-based chips, but there very likely are also gallium arsenide-based integrated circuits in that. Okay. Because you you need that sometimes things like gas as we call it gallium arsenide has a is better for for power uh -huh. electronics but I'm kind of spitballing here because exactly what chips are in that instrumentation all I know is we can get down to like four degrees K for the very reason you said to stop the interference so. I'm gonna go home and look this up so if you find me tomorrow uh, I might have an answer for you <laughs> anybody so. here from Tennessee <laughs> <laughs> I, okay well. What I'm really about to say is I apologize at a point of departure decision by the scientific community to standardize silicone over <laughs> had precluded your state becoming in the future an international industrial powerhouse of the globe, <laughs> where you eventually declared independence of America and were essentially in a Chinese-Taiwan situation. It would have been great for you. We're sorry. <laughs> but he's got so, another book. We've got another book. There we go. <laughs> so we are, we, are, we are beginning to run short on time, so I'm going to jump to our last question so we can leave some time for audience Q&A. And that is, um, there was a lot of discussion last year in a panel about everyone hating the moon and wanting it to go away. <laughs> so what would be the implications for our planet and our lives if either the moon had never... Um, you know, had had wandered off a long time ago, or if it just kind of disappeared tomorrow. Uh, I think I think Scott can start us off. And we die. And we die. And we die. So so um, the the bottom line is that the the moon. It's kind of neat when you talk about the you know, life out there and this notion that. Uh, you know that I think most of us have that there must be life out there somewhere, right? And and there must be somewhere at some time in space time intelligent life, and and we think maybe we're not that unique, but we kind of are. And one of the things that makes this planet really sort of unique in in the planetary environments is having a moon that is very large compared to our planet size, and it basically acts like a big gravitational lock, and it keeps us stable. It allow, the first thing it does, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask the, everybody else to chime in and maybe come back to a few items. But the most important thing it does from a, the sort of planetary geology standpoint is it keeps us from being Mars. Um, <laughs> we, and that is, and we know this, this is not just theoretical, because now we've gone to Mars, we've looked at rocks on Mars, we know what happens to Mars in the, without a moon, the, a big moon, and basically it all is about tilt, or what we call obliquity. So we have this little tiny, tiny tilt. We are, what, 21 and a half degrees to about 23 and a half degrees. We just sort of tick-tock like this over time scales of tens of thousands to 100,000 years. Just tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Mars does this. Yeah. And so equators become poles. Now you might say, well, again, you know, we've got fuel. We can, uh, you know, be toast, warm and toasty. Yeah. But things that we depended on evolving to get to us, couldn't do that. So that's an, having that amount of environmental change over time scales of tens of thousands of years an extraordinary stress on biologic systems so that if life existed at all on the planet, it wouldn't be anything like we know. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree on that because even you know, taking away a catastrophic effect, right, you know, affecting the tides and the ecosystems inside there, just even when I was thinking about it, even reflect, refracted light. You know, it, we think about night, it's dark outside. It's really when the, you know, you, you notice when there's a full moon out there, there is a lot of, there is still light. Mm -hmm. 
uh, at night. And the species that rely on the cycles that are provided by the moon, the light for navigation. And just imagine if your, your biorhythms of your body became reliant on the fact that you had periods of absolute darkness. Mm-hmm. You know, we totally void of light. And, and most like in the military, when we talk about a lot of our night vision devices and, and you see the movies or, you know, you're playing Call of Duty and you got the red lens, that is light amplification. Um, we actually use light amplification tubes and, and there's a lot of technology inside of there. But what we're doing is we are bringing additional electronics in there to augment the images of the light that's inside of there to project an image to your eyes because your eyes need to associate that light element for depth and perception. And that's why the first ones were really bad when I was a young lieutenant wandering around the woods bumping into trees because, you know, it was a monocular. There was no depth perception, but I could see that there should be a tree there. I just couldn't really (laughs) see exactly how far away it was. I could just see the shape of a tree. Now we're much, much better, and we actually have infrared augmentation and all that. So a lot of stuff you see in the video games now is actually pretty close uh, to what our soldiers on the battlefield have today. But... The absence of light that is reflected by the moon in your evenings and how that would affect everything from the animals to insects. I mean, the entire bio organisms that are creating the earth itself would be fractured because essentially they would lose sense of direction for half their lives. So how would that affect the ecology of the planet just because we lost our nightlight Mm -hmm. uh, inside of there, which is one of the things we don't often think about a lot. There's so many things that affect by the moon, either, you know, in terms of the physics or even the mythology. And I'm not Mm. sure if this is maybe between the two, but um, I have to refer again to this gentleman in the front who is a gynecologist. And we found that when he was a a resident, when he was on call on nights of a full moon, more, (laughs) yeah, more patients came in to deliver. Um, Now, uh, you can ask any, you know, resident, you know, young physician in OBGYN, if that's the case, and they will tell you when there's a full moon, more patients come in that evening. I don't know if it's a gravitational aspect or like tidal, um, but that was, you know, you knew you're not going to go to the movies or anything that night because, you know, there's just people coming in. Mm -hmm. And so I think whether that is, you know, legend or observation or or with super, you know, taking an observation and ex- ex- extending it maybe a bit farther than it should be. Nevertheless, as you say, both the light, but I would also maybe consider maybe the physical aspect of the gravitational balance being an effect mm-hmm. on us and our bodies and even down to, I'm not a biologist, right, but our responses at the cellular level mm-hmm. as to, you know, whether it's blood flow or even, you know, whatever. Um, I can't get those biology words out. <laughs> Took one course. Yeah, anyway. Uh, but things down to that level reacting to the change, even on such a minute scale. And I got to get back to my home base of the nano world. What we don't know in quantum mechanics as of yet, right? Hmm. So when we think of, and from the uh, sense of an astronomer, we think of gravitational effects. Mm-hmm. Or I have to throw out a plug for it, LSU LIGO, right? The um, yeah. where they discover the gravitational wave or evidence of it. Experimental. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it, but I'll just say, yeah, I don't know. yeah, I worked there. Um, but nevertheless, that that uh, prediction that was then experimentally um, shown in terms of gravitational waves, and that's a whole nother aspect. I don't want to get out of my lane here too much, but in terms of any gravitational effect on the moon, what does it do to us at that nanoscale and that quantum mechanical aspect? And is that is part of the part of the reason at all? Or is it crazy to say that it had anything to do with Schrodinger's cat and all that goes with that? They, those people in the back have a cat named Schrody. I t- couldn't couldn't name it. I said you can't name a, a girl cat Schrodinger. And I thought it's it's really kind of a crude joke anyway for y'all to know about Schrodinger's cat. But you can ask them later. Jen, do you have a yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, first of all, I, I apologize. This is my fault. I was doing Can You Yeet It last year, and my observing run had recently been ruined by the full moon. Um, <laughs> and so they were like, what would you like to fling to a different location? And I thought to myself, you know what would make my job easier? 
if the sky was darker, <laughs> because I do faint astronomy, and so I... Um, oh, God, don't come to Baton Rouge. Oh. Yeah, so Sorry. I decided that if I ejected the moon from the solar system, the sky would be dark, and it would be really much, much easier for me to do faint object astronomy, and uh, I still hold, hold to that belief. Um, I know it would kill us all, but like first I'd get some really amazing data. But then there'd be a secondary problem because then the moon is hurtling through space at ejection velocity from the solar system. Um, and then eventually it's going to hit something and like... That's not our problem. Right, well I was thinking well, about... Billion, it yeah. could be though because I was thinking about this problem and I'm like, okay, we're hypothesizing that there's another habitable planet out there somewhere and... As an exoplanet scientist, I'm sort of positing my career on this. And, like, if we hit another habitable planet with the moon from our solar system, like, that would be really bad. You're like the, do, 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 do you have a, the Shiva no, of the universe. No, do you have a brother named Marvin? No. <laughs> no, no, see, that, that's just where our dinosaurs went. Someone else yeeted their moon at us. There exactly. It was their time. You went back for the data, right, in, in um, Interstellar. And that is why that poor man... Had to spend see, the see, 200 Jim, years. <laughs> if, if you if you eat the moon to make your observation easier, and we all die, no, one, there's no one to give you more grant funding. <laughs> but I get some really cool science on the way out. <laughs> and so we, we we only have a few minutes left, so let's do some audience Q and A. Because I know y'all have been waiting. The hand way in the back that was first, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Try to, try to keep your questions short, and they should end with a question mark. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, uh, Kylan Rice, I'm a deep learning software engineer at Intel, and I've done a couple of, I've done some research at the uh, quantum computing lab in Hillsboro in Oregon. Um, and I had a question in regards to how y'all go. You'll mention that sometimes you'll cool down your tools um, to make the, I guess, the state more stable. Um, and I know in the lab, in, at least in Oregon, they use, like, lasers to kind of trap the atoms. And then they use, like, a combination of, like, microwave pulses and lasers. And they use a combination of microwave pulses and lasers to cool down the atoms to, like, microkelvins. But how how is that? Is that kind of – how do y'all cool down your tools? Is it a, something similar or is it – Sure. So in astronomy, we use um, things, for example, like um, liquid nitrogen. So we had an on-campus observatory um, where I did my PhD, where we had to cool some of our detectors, and we had a basically we we circulated um, liquid nitrogen through them or or other things like that. I'm I'm blanking on. I'll think of the other thing I'm trying to think of five minutes from now. Um, but that's an example, or or liquid helium, or other basically any any liquid that gets really cold. Um, is what we would use um, because we want it to be able to be liquid at very cold temperatures so it doesn't accidentally freeze while circulating through our um, our machinery. We had that happen once in an ice storm and it was not great. <laughs> yeah, I'll say ditto in that. Um, I mean, now the, this, this is LSU, so we're not using um, lasers and micro kelvins. I would love that grant money though, by the way. I could <laughs> Me too. Manage that. FFRDO. Hey, okay, but liquid nitrogen gets you down to 77 degrees mm -hmm. K, um, and in electronics, physical electronics, we use it with varying types of instrumentation that, say, it's, say you just have a chamber, and it's a vacuum chamber, and you want molecules of a certain species of material, say like gallium, to go from point A to B. You don't want it spewing all over the chamber. So you have a vacuum chamber, and you have the chamber constructed in such a way such that those when that gallium is heated up, it's going to make a column or beam straight to your target, right? Well, mm -hmm. even as it does that, and other materials, you know, also making those beams are going to what's called molecular beam epitaxy, if anybody's dealt with that, but it has I to did. do with, yay, did you, hey, high five. Okay, <laughs> I'm out of it now, it's a lot of work. But <laughs> it, was, it was a long time ago for me, too. <laughs> there you go. You have to make these thin films that you need, right, in, in electronics. So you want to get these perfectly atomically smooth films. Well, nonetheless, the materials that it takes to do that are still going in the chamber. You don't want those materials flying around. Like you don't want, if you're trying to, as we call it dope, nothing to do with drugs, but as we call it dope or material, say with um, silicon to uh, gallium arsenide to get it more N-type, more negative conductivity. Or you can dope it with beryllium to make it more P-type, what we call more positive conductivity. Bottom line is you don't want 
the negative and positive conductivity mixing up because then you've got to uh, cancel each other out. You basically make an insulator. So how do you stop it? You cool the chamber down, the walls of it, so you can have liquid nitrogen flowing through basically tubes in the wall of that chamber. So it's just like anything, it gets trapped, right? I heat you up, you want to move out of your seat. I cool you down, you freeze in place. Okay, and then for the four degree Kelvin, that's the, the, the um, liquid helium that is again used to cool down the equipment so that any sensing, anything that has to be, uh, as you said, you do, was it low light astronomy? Um, I do, uh, faint, yeah, faint astronomy. Faint astronomy, okay. So there are also a lot of processes where electrons want to move or even picking up. Uh, phonons, that's a bright vibration, right? Quantized vibration. If we want to be able to sense that to pick it up, we've got to get the interference of everything else out of there. So that's the four degree K. But what you just described is like a whole nother level of fantastic, you know, more intense science and a whole heck of a lot more money to do it. So do we... Uh, Take it. I just want to move through a few more quick questions if we can. Uh, and helium is fun enough. The super liquid behaviors is just incredibly painful. Next question. Um, yeah, I had a question on the whole ice becoming more dense topic. Would that mean, as for, based on my naive understanding, frostbite is caused by ice expanding and breaking your cells. Would that mean that humans couldn't be frozen to death if they, because the minute they pawed, their ice, their cells would still be intact. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I well, would think you'd stop breathing and pushing oxygen to your body. Yeah. And yes. Froze to death. One of the things I've seen, kind of in, in line with what you start off with, was not so much okay. Well, you know, let's assume that we evolved in a way to deal yeah, with this. If we had, if that had happened, then actually we would be very, mo very well equipped for long-term space flight. Yeah. Because we would be used to being frozen and woken back up. So yeah. would we, would we just like hibernate over the winter and like just sit out and freeze like some of the frogs do? Would better. <laughs> not, yeah. not, not much alter alternative. Next question. That's a good question. Please stump the panel. <laughs> no. I love it when they stump the panel. Yeah. <laughs> what if the nuclear strong force didn't exist? Ah. Uh, go on physics. I, I say I do physics, but not that part of it. I don't. I don't do that part either. <laughs> you win. Stump the panel. Hey. <laughs> bad things. I suspect. and then we die. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I suspect it would be really bad, but um. I do stellar atmospheres, sorry. Well, <laughs> we need you know, Stephen Grenade nothing. in here? I don't know. Well, you're, you wouldn't have a stellar atmosphere at all because the everything, I mean, it wouldn't be the, it's sort of the little bit of the water problem, right? But in reverse, everything would already just fly apart, so uh, okay. you yeah. couldn't have any perfusion. Yeah, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have any, any atoms, would we? No. It'd be bad. No atoms would be really bad. That's another one. We're dead. <laughs> This is the most fatalistic panel I've ever had. The panel's gotten very depressing. Does anyone have an optimistic Can... question? <laughs> is, there, we got one back there. Well, like Nietzsche, well, is Nietzsche in here? Like, <laughs> better, it better not be but, depressing. But by the way, you know, I just forgot about the talking about the moon things and get on the moon. Just for any literature fans out there, uh, how many of you uh, like Mark Twain? And, and there's a story called the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. That would have been about 20 pages long without a moon. <laughs> and, and, and really, think of no eclipses and the effect that's had on people throughout time. And also for my, my neighbor here, uh, you probably wouldn't have a job because without a moon, there would be this political aspect that uh, we probably would have already nuked everybody to death because we wouldn't have had a place to fight over in proxy. Uh, I would have been... Building yep. the Imperial battle fleet to invade the next side of the planet. Anyway, let's, let's, let's get so. one audience, one more audience question yep. in before we got to run. Uh, <clears throat> quick paradigm: Humans are quantum computers and quantum detectors. We can view changes in pigment, or we can view color differences because of a couple of molecules. We can smell different isotopes. So whether something is a C14 or a C15, um, 
brains are very simple computers, massively parallelized and constantly retraining themselves to go, okay, is that a bear or a person in a bear costume? How scared do I need to be? So what if one of these massive shifts happen, we start detecting time differently, start detecting light differently, start having to process. What if we just figure it out? Well, okay, what is the way? Put the mic. What, what, Sorry. Can um, you please eat the mic so we can hear you? Uh, yeah. Okay. Humans are massive, parallelized quantum machines. So we can think uh, like a quantum computer. We can see differences in molecules and pigment. We can smell different isotopes. So what if one of these horrible things, or one of these things we think might be horrible happens, like time shifts or light completely changes how it views, and humans just adapt and figure it out and I teach think, each other? I think my question would be, would we adapt before we died, basically? Is, exactly. Is yeah. my, my question, and I, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know, but is, my question would be, is evolution fast enough? But if we assume that we did evolve in the manner that you described, then, I mean, the next syllogism and the assumption would have to be, well, yeah, we'd adapt. But, I mean, you know, it's like the fight I've had with people as to what's a life form, right? So mm -hmm. you got your, you know, they say we're ugly bags of water, the silicon life form on next generation, right? But there were a sentient life form. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think if, if we assume that we had evolved into such a position as you described, then I guess we could assume we'd adapt. But, <laughs> yeah. great point. I just wanted to have like a conversation. You did what? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, unfortunately, we are actually over time and we need to close up this room. So, thank you all for joining us. Uh, please remember to rate us in the app. Rate the panels in the app. It's how we figure out what you liked and what you didn't. Uh, donate to the charity if you haven't already. And otherwise, thanks for joining us, and you can see us over in the Hilton Grand, uh, Hilton Grand West um, for Parasitism for Fun and Profit. Thank you!